All right, let's start again. Good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we are uh, glad to have you again in the series on theories of regulation. Today with us uh, two uh, leading uh, scholars, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Tanya Brozel and Professor uh, Dr. Thomas Risse. Uh, if we are speaking about political science, international relations, public policy in Europe, uh, those two uh, scholars are uh, one of the, you know, a major force in shaping the research agenda. Uh, for sure in uh, Berlin, Germany, but also Europe and, and, and all over the world. And today they are always asked to present their um, uh, new book um, on effective uh, gov governance under anarchy. And without doing, you know, too, too, without going too much in, in length, I will uh, ask them to, to start. So Tanya and Thomas, very nice to have you with us and uh, please go. The floor is Thank yours. you so much, David. It is it is a real pleasure to see you all, if only virtually, and I hope we have the opportunity to meet in person very soon. Um, both uh, the numbers in Israel and Germany are quite encouraging, so I hope um, this will be one of the last virtual uh, uh, presentations we do. Thanks very much for giving us the opportunity to present our book. It is here. Well, it's uh, 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 <laughs> that well, doesn't work. Okay, uh, the I, I will show. I'm overwhelmed with uh, with having to focus on two people, but you're going to see the cover in a moment anyway. And let us uh, let us start by saying that we're extremely pleased to have this opportunity to present our book in this format because regulation and governance has been very important in helping us to develop key concepts and arguments. Uh, uh, that ultimately made it into the book. So thank you very much, David, for having us. And now I start sharing the screen, um, which um, start the presentation. You should see it okay. So this is the Excellent. cover. Um, if you've been wondering what it actually shows, it is a picture of the currency of Somaliland, uh, which is not a state, but has its own currency. And that already tells you something about um, um, uh, the topic of our book, effective governance under anarchy, institutions, legitimacy, and social trust in areas of limited statehood. And actually we managed to pick a title that has everything in there, right? All the key concepts are in the title, which explains why it's such a long title. So, um, the way we are going to proceed is, this is essentially the, uh, the contents of the book. Uh, so um, I will actually start with uh, briefly setting out uh, the scene. Um, the world is not Denmark, meaning the world is not characterized by uh, states that are capable and willing to provide public goods uh, and services to their citizens. Uh, Denmark being a sort of an example of such a state. I'm not so sure whether this is still entirely true, but that's a different story. Then um, I will very briefly introduce uh, uh, the core, some of the core concepts. Um, uh, um, and Thomas will lay out the, the puzzle the book seeks to, uh, to address, the, the governance puzzle, as we call it. And then I will give you an idea how we solve uh, the governance puzzle, uh, focusing on actors uh, and conditions under which actors, both state and non-state, are willing and able to engage in effective governance in situations in which the state is not doing its job. So this gives you an idea what not only what the book is about, but what all the ground we, uh, we seek to cover in uh, about 30 minutes, right? We try to be brief because we are looking very much forward. Uh, to comments uh, and questions, even though the book is published now. So, um, you know, it's done. We, of course, uh, continue working on these issues also uh, in the context of, a, of our cluster of excellence, which you see down here, contestations um, of the liberal script. Um, okay, so let me go right into it. The world is not Denmark, uh, but the world is characterized, has been characterized historically and still is characterized currently by what we call areas of limited statehood. And um, the definition is that those are areas in which 
central state authorities lack the capacity to implement, enforce central decisions, usually that which usually take the form of the law and or lack the monopoly over the means of violence. This is sort of a quintessential definition of what the state distinguishes from other forms of political authority, right? And um, there is, seems to be a basic assumption that the end of history, you know, the sort of the, the, the ultimate accomplishment of civilization is the state as the form of political rule that is, is, is providing effective and legitimate governance. And we say this may well be, but the fact is that the world has never been Denmark and it's very unlikely to be ever be Denmark. 80% of the world populations live in areas in which the state is not doing its job, is not um, um, providing rules and, and public goods and services and does not uh, control the monopoly over the means of violence. And that is the challenge. And now the question is, can can, can these are and can these areas of a limited statehood still be governed even though the state is not capable of doing so? And this brings us to the governance puzzle. What you see here is Nigeria. And this is uh, important to make the point that we speak of areas of limited statehood and not states, right? Because each and every state, even Denmark, I would claim, has some areas of limited statehood in, in which the, the reach of the state is limited. Um, if not uh, with regard to the monopoly of the use of means of violence, uh, it is about uh, the, the, the capacity to implement, enforce um, um, collectively binding decisions. So, and this is a map of Nigeria, which uses indicators um, based on certain data on the monopoly of violence and shows how substantially uh, th this varies, can vary within a state, right? So it's not, we do have extreme cases that are complete failed states where, you know, um, it's it's 100% or 99% areas of limited statehood, but most states actually um, are differentiated. So there are areas of consolidated statehood, but there are also areas uh, well, where statehood is limited. And um, so this is sort of the, the starting point. And uh, Thomas will now briefly introduce uh, um, you the puzzle the book seeks to address. So, um, so the world is full of areas of limited statehood. However, and that's the puzzle, areas of limited statehood are neither ungovernable nor ungoverned. And in fact, what we see is a huge variation. What this governance, what this slide does, uh, or what this graph does on the on the y-axis, um, uh, it uh, uh, on the y-axis it shows various governance services. Where uh, on top of it uh, the the services would be fully provided, and where it says zero, uh, it would not be provided. On the x-axis we use measurements uh, of statehood and degrees of statehood where one would be fully consolidated statehood and, uh, and zero would be uh, essentially no statehood at all. And what you see here, each dot uh, represents uh, one governance service uh, per country. So uh, security, uh, um, uh, pro uh, provision of infrastructure, economic subsistence, uh, education, environment, and health. And I don't want to go through this. I, can, I can't even tell you which dot represents which country, but the, the only thing is, uh, so you have areas of limited statehood. Look at the middle, you know, where you have, where statehood is at, at the range of, of, of uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. And that means uh, there are huge areas uh, where the state is really uh, weak and, and even has lost its monopoly of the use of violence. Nevertheless, in many of these cases, you actually have pretty much well-governed areas. And that presents the puzzle. And let me go now uh, zoom in on one particular country. Uh, you saw it already on the cover, you know, the currency of Somaliland, which is on the second, uh, on, the, um, on, the, on, the, on the left-hand side. Uh, this is this represents Somalia. 
Somalia hasn't had a, a, a or has, has been a failed state in any kind of data set uh, since uh, the early 1990s. So, so this is pretty much for the last uh, uh, 30 years. Um, so what this, uh, what this graph shows is incidence of violence for a 20 year period from 1990 to 2000, 2010. And what you can see on this graph is that violence is actually very diverse. That is, there are areas in that country of Somalia where there are very few acts of violence during that time and others where actually violence prevails. It pretty much prevails in central Somalia. You see the, the capital Mogadishu. This is where the fighting uh, has been continuous, almost continuously uh, been the case. And then on, and this concerns infrastructure on the access roads uh, uh, to Mogadishu. But if we go, go up, this is the blue, uh, blue shaded area. That is the province of Somaliland. And that province uh, has been rather peaceful over this 20 years period. And if we could extend it to the 2020, um, uh, the, uh, the, the sign would not be uh, uh, much, much different. Now, uh, this, uh, this concerns here security. We could do the same uh, with health governance, for example. Um, uh, for example, um, um, a study has shown uh, that uh, when it comes to um, anti-malaria uh, uh, distribution of anti-malaria bed nets, Actually, even in the failed areas of Somalia, the distribution was almost 100%. Why? Because it's a rather simple task. When it comes to HIV AIDS, and I don't have data on the recent pandemic, on the COVID-19 pandemic for Somalia at the moment, uh, but if you look at HIV AIDS, which is, which is a hugely complex governance task, there we find huge variation. Once again, Somaliland, is doing extremely fine, while central Somalia has not been able to fight the pandemic, uh, the, 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 the HIV AIDS crisis um, at all. So, which brings us now to the question, okay, so here we have the governance puzzle pretty much uh, focused on one single uh, uh, country, which brings us now to the question, how do we try to solve the governance puzzle? That is, what explains uh, the variation of effective governance? Exactly. So, Over uh, to you. yes, thank you. So how do we explain the governance puzzle? Why is it that some areas or some countries, um, that is the, that is one of the, the challenges, the methodological nationalism. This is why it's so important uh, to zoom in uh, on countries like Somalia, which are quintessential failed states. And within these failed states, though, there is substantive variation with regard to the quality of governance, right? Uh, and um, But even if you aggregate at the country level, you see that some areas of limited state will clearly overperform in terms of effective governance uh, when you look at, uh, at, at, the, at the degree of statehood they have or they underperform. And in order to explain that, we focus on the one hand on non-state actors as governors and we're not only looking so much, we're also looking at them, but we're not only focusing on the usual suspects, the NGOs, and increasingly also companies. No, we also consider violent non-state actors, rebel groups, religious terrorist groups, uh, uh, organized crime, so the not so nice guys. And um, we also look at traditional authorities, right? So we try to uh, provide an overview on the book uh, uh, over the variety of actors that have and potentially could engage in governance in, if the state is not delivering. And we look at state actors as governors or, uh, or rather as spoilers, right? I mean, there is a bias in the literature that tends to assume that the state is always sort of, you know, the, 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 the default provider of, of, of governance services and that good enough governance is governance by other state, by, by non-state actors. And we essentially try to uh, adopt a more neutral approach to the role of the state, pointing to the fact that state, the state is both part of the solution, but very often or even more often part of the problem for areas in limited areas, for governance in areas of limited statehood. So, 
We have identified to explain the governance puzzle what we need to do. We need first to explain why, why actors, state and non-state actors that have the capacity to govern, actually, you know, when are they actually willing to use their capacity to provide collective goods and services or to provide uh, uh, rules for the production of collective goods and services? That is the first part. Uh, what we call sort of commitment or engagement in governance. But engagement in governance is not the same as effective governance, right? There's uh, only because uh, actors are willing to provide certain goods and services um, doesn't necessarily mean they do it in an effective way. And so we essentially identified three sets of factors that uh, impact both the willingness of actors, both state and non-state to engage in governance and the effectiveness of their governance contributions. And I will very briefly walk you through these three different sets. We introduce them systematically at the, in the theory chapter of the book and then apply this framework to different issue areas looking at different types of actors, right? That is sort of, so we have a, a matrix that combines uh, actors and, uh, and issue areas. Um, okay, so here we go. The first is, and I will dwell mostly on social trust and empirical legitimacy because the first one, the institutional setting is well established in the literature here. We don't really add much to, uh, to the state of the art. As uh, suffice to say that if that institutions play a key role in solving collective action problems, right? This is a key argument in the governance literature that institutions enable to so uh, actors to solve collective action problems. And then of course, it depends on the type of collective action problems you have, whether it's a coordination or a collaboration. There are different typologies. And we essentially argue the institutions have to be fit for purpose, meaning the institutions have to design have to be designed in a way that they address the collective action problem at hand. It makes a difference, uh, as Thomas already mentioned, whether you have a simple governance task, a one-shot vaccination, or whether it's a more complex governance task that requires repeated action and the involvement of a variety of actors, very often at different levels of government. Much more complex requires a different institutional design. Inclusiveness is very important to also indirectly, I mean, inclusiveness generates legitimacy and social trust, the two other sets of explanatory factors. So we're not saying these are independent variables, right? Of course, these three sets of factors interact, they can reinforce, they can undermine themselves in the book at the very end specifies such potential interaction effects, if you want to use the language of quantitative methods. So inclusiveness is important and residual status. We're not saying, this is not a book that says three cheers for anarchy, right? In the sense of forget about the state. No, we're always saying is that statehood uh, defined as the capacity to set and enforce collectively binding rules and uh, or uh, have uh, control the monopoly over the use of violence. Um, is ambivalent. It can be used for the provision of collective goods and services. It can also be used for rent seeking. And in areas of limited statehood, the problem very often is that residual statehood, that's what's left, is used for rent seeking and for repression rather than for governance, right? And this then begs the whole question of how important the embeddedness of statehood in rule of law and democracy matters. Denmark, after all, is not only a consolidated state, it's a democratic state with an effective rule of law. And um, I just want to flag that. So legitimacy, legitimacy, the right to rule, the license to govern. We focus on empirical, not normative legitimacy. And we identify essentially, again, this is the work of Fritz Schaaf and also Renate Mainz. I mean, um, this is, is not, not something we have invented here. We draw on, on the distinction between input, throughput, and output legitimacy. And um, the important thing here is uh, the fact that, again, these different sources of empirical legitimacy interact. They can reinforce each other. They can uh, enter a virtuous circle, right? Uh, output legitimacy in terms of effectiveness, acceptance uh, because of effectiveness can increase sort of uh, legitimacy and social acceptance um, and the other way around. Input legitimacy can increase or can foster output legitimacy. So there is an interaction effect. And uh, I leave it here. You know, um, this is just to give you an idea. Social trust. This is 
where uh, we, I think we are particularly grateful to regulation and governance because there we published uh, uh, the, the first, re the first uh, full blown article in which we developed the argument about trust, which then made it uh, into the book. And we went through several rounds of revise and resubmit. And uh, you know, the review is pushing us to make a really strong and convincing argument. So, and, uh, and here we have really have to acknowledge. So what uh, regulation and governance did to the book. So trust, this is just uh, two, two definitions. I think, um, 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 I think the important, what is important here is the challenge, personalized trust and particularistic trust is extremely prevalent in areas of limited status. The challenge though is to generalize these kind of trust relations because even particularistic trust is, is very often exclusionary, right? It is confined to a particular governance collective and pitches one governance collective against another. And then the challenge is to, to, uh, to bridge, right? Uh, um, and so we're trying to identify factors that foster the generalization, the upscaling of trust relations, imagined communities. And this is what we have really developed in this regulation and governance article. So social trust. Um, now, um, why don't you move on, honey? Um, so what we're going to do now, this is very abstract, right? So what Thomas is going to do now is give you, give you some examples we have elaborated on in the book, how actors, uh, how these sets of, of, of factors actually make actors contribute to governance and, and, and factors, how these factors shape the effectiveness of their governance contributions. So um, let me briefly walk you through three examples, uh, four examples actually, um, about specific actors and the conditions under which they actually provide effective governance. Uh, the first one is violent non-state actors. These are mostly actors we don't particularly like, rebel groups, uh, even Islamist uh, terrorist groups, what have you. Nevertheless, there are very interesting data out now that argue that in fact, violent non-state actors um, do provide governance services, but under certain circumstances. The first is uh, they have to be uh, what Manko Olsen calls uh, uh, stationary bandits. That is, uh, they have to control some territory. If you have roving bandits, that is violent non-state actors that, that move on, uh, there's, it's very unlikely that they provide any kind of governance. But once they control territory, uh, they start providing governance services, not because they are particularly altruistic because uh, they want to do something for the common good, but simply to gain both legitimacy on the ground. We call it here domestic, that is, or you could say lo local. That is, you can't, you can't repress the entire population 100% of the time. So you need some sort of legitimacy, but also in the gain of international legitimacy. For example, there is a very good study out that shows that rebel groups who are close to victory, close to really taking over a territory, they try to seek international legitimacy, for example, to get, uh, toward, uh, to get foreign aid and stuff like this. And in order to do that, they provide governance. Um, another, uh, uh, another type of actors are the so-called traditional, and this is in parenthesis here because tradition here uh, is a social construction. A lot of, uh, and I don't want to go there, you know, chiefs, tribal leaders, and the, even religious leaders, uh, they are called in the literature traditional authorities, but you, you should think about that these are, uh, that this has to be taken with a little grain of salt. But anyway, and Somaliland, I, I used the, the example of some, Somaliland before is actually uh, a perfect example why it is that effective governance uh, is provided uh, in areas of limited state because it's ruled by so-called traditional authorities. So why do they, why are they able to do this? Number one is they have legitimate authority. Might be personal, um, uh, might be, uh, um, uh, and, and this authority usually um, uh, resides in the properties 
of these authorities. Okay. Uh, the second is there, uh, there's a lot of data and actually Somaliland again is a super example for this, uh, social trust on the ground. Uh, in many of these areas of limited statehood, uh, we find both personal trust, but even group based, uh, based trust, providing the sources for, for a collective action capacity. Again, this is not evented from us. This is actually comes right out of, um, what's her name? Social trust, collective action capacity, die, die, I'm blanking. Die, die Stolle? Nein. No. Nein. Nobel Prize. Oh, Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom, damn it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just blank. So Eleanor Ostrom has really shown the connection between social trust on the ground and the capacity of groups to actually govern themselves in the absence of hi uh, hierarchical rule. So let me continue uh, in the interest of time. Yeah, we have very, very little time left. Um, external governors. So from foreign aid here, it's a, it's a picture of Médecins Sans Frontières as an NGO group. Here, institutional design issues are again uh, really crucial. Uh, sufficient resources, I mean, that's, uh, that's sort of a given, but also, and that was one of the major issues uh, with a lot of the, the state building exercises by, by various uh, uh, external state actors, uh, local knowledge. If you don't have local, local knowledge, you cannot con uh, contribute to governance from the outside. And last not least, flexible, uh, flexible process management with inbuilt learning uh, capacity. So, so you need to adapt to the, to the uh, uh, conditions on the ground. Uh, a huge issue for external governance is that they need to have legitimacy on the ground. Yeah, again, this is one of, one of the big reasons why the huge state building exercises, you know, think Afghanistan has actually uh, 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 more or less failed. Uh, last not least, let's talk about non, so-called non-state justice institutions. Uh, the, figure, um, uh, the figure shows a jirga uh, in Afghanistan uh, composed uh, pretty much uh, by elders. There's very interesting data out comparing various of these non-state uh, justice ins institutions with uh, the question, you know, do they actually provide access to justice or do these justice institutions nothing else but replicate the existing power structure? So the male elders get their way and if you are poor, you rural woman, uh, that's it. And here, institutional design matters a lot and if you see the bullet points, you know what? It looks like a Habermasian deliberative institution. And that's exactly what data for Africa, Asia, and Latin America show for Afghanistan as well as Burundi. Uh, the, 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 the data show if these, uh, if these non state justice institutions um, work as if they were Habermasian deliberative uh, bodies, they can actually empower uh, poor people, uh, poor, uh, poor women in rural areas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so they would serve uh, their purpose. So these are just four uh, quick examples. Let me, um, let me come back. I mean, uh, as is pretty much obvious, or I think uh, should be obvious, uh, there are some policy conclusions here, um, because I mean a lot of that work has, of course, uh, consequences for uh, for uh, for uh, for policies. And we, here we focus on the so-called external governance governors, that is, uh, foreign aid agencies, international organizations, international non-governmental organizations. Uh, you know the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, that were in the other picture. So number one, Denmark uh, is great, but it's not the end of history. And the absence of Denmark doesn't mean uh, that, uh, uh, that areas of limited state, uh, statehood are somehow lost. Um, that's a huge argument that goes against pretty much uh, the, the whole gist of modernization theory. We can go, this, uh, go there uh, in the, uh, the Q&A later on. Uh, 
Secondly, limited statehood is not the problem per se. The problem is lack of governance. And these things need to be kept uh, separate. That's, very, uh, that's a very important point. We have to say, though, that our, our work and the work of others shows pretty much that the lack of violence is a precondition for e effective governance except for very, very simple task. For example, child immunization you can do under conditions of a civil war, but not much else. If you want to educate people um, and, 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 and want to provide more complex uh, health governance, you need to have some sort of public security. And that is where we stop being anarchists. Because if this is sustainable, it has at, at the end of the day probably provided by the state or the governors who govern very much look like a state. You know, rebel groups that have be, that have essentially taken over uh, a state uh, state task. What that means now for 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 policies is that the emphasis should be on governance and resilience building. We sneaked in resilience here uh, because that's the new catchword. Uh, by the EU, but, but also by a lot of development agencies now um, for, uh, for what one can do in areas of limited statehood and so-called fragile state. But the, the emphasis would be away from state building. To give you an example, uh, if you have an autocratic weak state and you engage in state building, what you do is you increase the capacity for repression and nothing much, uh, nothing much more. So state building shouldn't be the focus, but governance and, so, uh, and, and, and resilient build, building. External governance needs social acceptance and legitimacy, both at home, otherwise they can't go in far, far away places, uh, but then also abroad. And I, don't, I can't go here, but there, there's a lot of trade-offs here, yeah? Um, for example, we can, we, can, we can discuss about Afghanistan, what's currently happening is in Afghanistan with the, um, uh, with the um, announced withdrawal uh, of all foreign troops uh, in the, uh, this year, uh, and which has been done for, for at home, uh, let me say, uh, legitimacy reasons, but uh, uh, causes real serious problems. Uh, on the ground. Uh, one thing that external governance can do is that they can support fair and trans transparent institutions. There is a huge literature out there, both in social psychology and in sociology. This is Dietlin Stol uh, Stolte, Stolle, uh, Stolle uh, uh, and others that show that if people, if, if people experience fair and transparent institutions that this builds social trust. In fact, generalized social trust. And generalized social trust is again a precondition for social resilience under very adverse circumstances. So uh, we leave it here, you know, um, and we hope to have you, given you at least a kind of brief overview what is uh, in the almost 400 pages uh, <laughs> of the book. And we stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, Tanya. A fascinating uh, uh, manifestation of the governance uh, paradigm, I would say, uh, that combine nowadays international relations and public policy, uh, bringing new, new ideas, new way of looking to the political science and social science literature. And um, I, 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 would, uh, I would like to open up the, the, the floor for questions. And we have one uh, from Marcus uh, already. Uh, Marcus, do you want to, to come in? And uh, you can see it by, in the chat, uh, Thomas and, uh, and um, Tanya. But uh, Marcus, do you want to... to present it yourself for the video, for the sake of yeah. the video, or shall I do it? Yeah. And, 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 and Mina will uh, go second. So, Marcus, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for a fascinating presentation. Um, 
I didn't realize that this kind of activity was ongoing. Um, my question really is if you have, you mentioned that something like 80% of the heirs in the world um, are suffering from this issue of, of, of governance. Have you or are you intending to do any kind of ranking of, of areas that, that are affected by, by this kind of governance um, in terms of putting kind of a road, uh, not a roadmap, but a kind of ranking of, of areas or countries? Because I think that would be very, very interesting, especially when it applies to some countries which are considered to be well governed, but have areas in them that are, that are not well governed. Uh, I'm thinking in areas of France or, as you mentioned yourself, in Denmark. But then I, I wondered if you have this, this kind of concept, where would a country like Gaza come? Um, because on the surface, Gaza would appear to be well managed by a terrorist group. But, but how, how, would you, how would you rank it in, in this kind of ranking? Thanks. Please. Uh, first of all, no, such, uh, 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 such a data set doesn't exist. And the and one problem is that we have a lot of data sets on so-called fragile and failed states. The problem with these data sets is that they conflate limited statehood with lack of governance. So they measure a limited statehood of state fragility by the inability of certain service provision. That's mostly what these failed states uh, data sets uh, do. So, so for us, we need to disentangle these things in order uh, to even get at our research question, right? So secondly, most data sets focus on entire states. We talk about areas. We're not arguing that, uh, that Berlin is an area of, of limited statehood. But I can show you neighborhoods in Berlin that where central uh, authorities are unable to, in, or maybe unwilling or both, uh, to enforce the law. You know, a famous um, uh, area here for a long time was the, was the so-called uh, Görlitzer Park, uh, a, a park where essentially the drug trade in Berlin uh, took place and where the police essentially gave up and they even put up signs uh, to people, you know, if you, if you enter this area, you're on your own. I mean, this is by definition almost an area of limited state. So, so, and that makes it, and that's the point why it may, why, uh, why it's so difficult. We've shown you that graph about Nigeria. You have to really go on the subnational level. And even that province, and this is still focusing on entire provinces. Yeah, so, so it's extremely difficult to actually measure, uh, measure limited statehoods. Therefore, we do have data for, for example, we mapped it for Somalia, we mapped it for Nigeria, and I think for another, uh, for a couple of other Sub-Saharan Africa state, is there, uh, I mean, that would be one of the big um, challenges ahead, you know, the kind of research challenges uh, to really develop a, a global data set on uh, on these issues. And then the Hamas question you answered. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, obviously, we're both not experts on, on, on the Middle East, right? Uh, and in fact, all a lot, most of the empirical data we draw on in the book is based on 12 years of research conducted uh, in the Collaborative Research Center, Governance in Areas of Limited Statehood. Uh, so we have immensely benefited from the research of others. And then of course, a lot of, of, you know, of literature went into that. Um, so a lot uh, we learned about how um, uh, the Gaza Strip is based on the on 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 books on two books by this is this Benedetta is, Berti Benedetta Berti and um, okay it will come in a second I'm sorry it's maybe the heat um, but let me tell you what is you're absolutely right Hamas is the governance provider in Gaza and I mean up to an extent you could argue it has developed into a quasi state right I mean there are not many other actors that provide governance and if so they do it in collaboration with rather than as an alternative to so but then the question is why has Hamas who is a terrorist organization uh, at least where this is where it came from um, has been willing increasingly willing to engage in 
in the provision of governance, right? And this is where the argument about uh, the rebel groups come in. Thomas re referred to the closer these groups uh, come to taking over power and actually become, you know, uh, um, um, becoming the government of an area, the more, the greater their quest of legitimacy and the legitimacy they seek by providing governance services. And I think this is this, this explains a lot what is going on in the Gaza Strip. And the key issue for, for Hamas is the inclusiveness of the governance provision, because the question is to what extent do they provide governance services to, uh, uh, to non-Muslim communities, for instance. In the Gaza Strip, this is not so much an issue, but Hezbollah in Lebanon, for instance, there it is an issue, right? So it's about the inclusiveness of governance uh, uh, provision. And... Um, here again, a key incentive is moving from particularistic or group-based trust to more general trust is to make the governance provision more inclusive. And we would argue the closer these groups come to taking over pow the power and becoming actually state actors by, by practical means, by all practical purposes, not by recognition internationally necessary, the more they are willing to, uh, to really become governors that provide services beyond the limits of their own community. And I would leave it here. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Um, and there is a question here for Mina, and I think her microphone doesn't work. And she, she asked about uh, the relations between NGOs and the increasing number of NGOs and the statehood. statehood. Uh, in which way is it connected, uh, if at all? And this is, this is you want to, Emina, you want to elaborate? I think this is a very important question. I think, uh, our microphone okay, might, I ah, think, okay, good. okay, you can hear me now. Um, so well, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I was uh, thinking about your former work on the Balkans and the limited statehood, statehood in um, ex Yugoslav states. So for what would, for example, an increased presence of NGO mean for Bosnia as opposed to Somaliland? So if there are, uh, we had evidence previously um, that, for example, Somaliland um, owns a lot of its rehabilitation, post-war uh, reconstruction to the presence of NGOs. But then on the other hand, in some other places, such as arguably Bosnia, we would have a, a lot of international structures or lo local non-governmental structures which actually with time kind of diminish the efficiency of, of governments. So is it context bound? Do you think that there's a relationship? And if yes, what's the direction of that relationship? Is it context bound and how? That was what I was wondering. Thank you very much. Um, well, everything is, is context bound. The question is to what extent do our mm -hmm. three sets of variables explain mm -hmm. The variation in terms of effective governance NGOs provide, right? NGOs are present in both, but I mean, if I understood you correctly, you would argue that their governance has been more effective in the case of Somalia uh, as compared to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then the, we would, I mean, without, I mean, I know quite a bit about Bosnia and Herzegovina, I know less about uh, Somalia, but I think the key here is the institutional design. Um, the way in which uh, you know the, these governance arrangements uh, in which the NGOs uh, have been involved are designed very differently with regard to all the factors that Thomas uh, has explained with regard to the flexibility, the use of local knowledge. I mean, in Bosnia Herzegovina, these NGOs are very often, how shall I put it? They many of them and. This is also from a critical point of view, have turned into implementation agencies of the European Union and other external donors. So it's not so much about governance, you know, somehow, yes, but they are very much uh, occupied by writing grant applications, by complying with the EU's accountability. This is all very important, right? But um, they are different, the, the design, institutional design is different for, from what we've seen in Somalia uh, and the ways in which the NGOs there engage. Maybe Thomas, you wanna, you wanna add on Somalia or? No, no. But I mean, the, the, the hypothesis would indeed be um, if these NGOs, let's talk about the EU. For a very long time, 
uh, the EU had organizational blueprints yeah, for the various countries in which they were engaged in capacity building. You know, a kind of script. You know, what does a state need? You need a constitutional court, you need administrative courts and blah, 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 blah. Uh, now um, I see Lutz Leisering, who is familiar with sociological institutionalism. We know exactly what happens if you just throw a particular institutions to a country uh, that has never had that kind of experience, what you get is de decoupling, very easy. Yeah? You have a constitutional court, but maybe the, the, the justices have nothing to do with constitutions. Maybe uh, this court uh, doesn't do much, you know, because the power structure underneath does something else. So, uh, and come back to the EU and maybe to some of these NGOs as kind of implementation agents. Um, once you do this blueprinting, uh, it's bound to fail. I mean, this is why it needs to be fit for purpose, which sounds completely trivial, yeah, but still isn't being done. I can tell you stories for hours about Afghanistan. You know, uh, what external actors tried to implant into Afghanistan, which had never, you know, up to the point where there was a fight between the Germans and the Americans at one point, whether one should have a public broadcasting system like in Germany or a private uh, broadcasting system like in the US, yeah, as if the Afghans cared that much about this. So, so, so that would be our answer for this. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. And Tolga, please. It's harder maybe earlier than me, but um, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, ladies first, but please excuse me this time. Uh, because the boss said, go ahead. Um, this was wonderful. This is astounding. I, I feel I feel terrible that I haven't been keeping up with your work, Tanya and Thomas, on limited statehood. I should. Um, I will. I promise. Um, the, I really applaud the depth and breadth of, of all this. This is, I think it's an, it's an, it has been an eye opener uh, for me at least. Um, which also will, I think, promises, all this work promises that what we always talk about, not only in Europe, but also in my country, uh, whatever we say will be more general and generic, thanks to your work. I, I, really, I really think that we can, um, we can work with these concepts better than before. So I, I, I really enjoyed listening to this. I, I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, in addition, I mean, I, I know, Thomas, you, you mentioned Berlin, um, the park, uh, which is also, and again, um, again, so much in reaction to the modern modernization theory. It's also, you know, again, so much against the conventional wisdom. Uh, this was, uh, this was astounding. My, my first question is, um, do you happen to see detect, um, stumble on any policy area variation, variation across any policy areas in the state of Denmark. After all, there must be something rotten in the area of Denmark. Uh, do you see any variation across sector, sectors? Um, and, and secondly, very quickly, what does this all mean um, for the state. I know we're not talking, we're, we're talking about limited statehood and we're talking about governance, but what next for the state? I want to hear your, your, uh, your thoughts on this. Thank you. It's, it's delightful to be with you all. It's always nice to hear Tolga. And now you have to answer Tanya and, and, and uh, Thomas. I see you are uh, muted or uh, Yes. Okay, now can we go, go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, so that's a great question, Tolga. What is rotten in the state of Denmark? Of course, this is also a normative question, but I think your question points to the general issue uh, that, um, that governance failure is not confined to areas of limited statehood. In fact, you know, 
but it should be still more pronounced. Um, and this is what we see, right? If you if you remember the governance puzzle, the graph with the dots at the extreme points with very consolidated statehood and very, very limited uh, statehood, there is very low and very high uh, uh, levels of governance provision respectively, right? So, and Denmark arguably, you know, across the board has certainly a higher level of, 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 of quality and governance provision. Having said this, again, we are currently witnessing serious instances of governance failure in Europe, right, in consolidated states, including Denmark. The question is, why is that? You know, I mean, we have huge problems with social inequality. Not everything is great in the state of Denmark. But the question is, why is that? Is this because the state lacks the capacity to set and enforce rules? It doesn't control the monopoly of the use of violence, or is it a political decision, right? I mean, there's a lot of talk about the neoliberal turn. I don't want to go into that. And it's not always easy to disentangle willingness and capabilities, but I, I guess we, I think we agreed that Denmark could do more in terms of fighting social inequality, for instance, right? Then it is it has been doing, and that this was it, this has been a political decision, and not a lack of of, of capacity to engage in in better and more inclusive uh, and more sustainable economic growth, for instance, right? And I think that's Thomas. You want to add? Yeah, I want to add something on the question very briefly on the on the role of the state in all of this. So as we said, uh, we are not anarchists. For example, we think uh, that basic security in the long run has to be provided by a state, but even that can, by the way, break down. You know, uh, on January 6, the US Capitol turned into an area of limited statehood because US authorities for a variety of reasons we're not prepared to uphold the monopoly over the use of force in the U.S. Capitol. But they could have. Okay? They could have if they were better prepared. So in that sense, it was temporary. But I mean, uh, it, it, it was a governance breakdown. So the other, re the other serious question in the literature about in this context is, so, okay, uh, Security need, probably needs to be, basic security probably needs ultimately be provided uh, by, a fun, by, uh, uh, by a state. What about other governance services? Not necessarily. 100% uh, administrative capacity, not necessary. Now the big question is, when actors other than the state provide these services, does that weaken the state further? The answer is no, it actually strengthens the state. We have, there's a lot of data now that have looked at this and they show that people actually ascribe in some cases, uh, the provision of services to the state, even if the state had nothing to do with it. You know, with a kind of reasoning, okay, I mean, if we get good health care and stuff like this, you know, if, if, um, if it can take care, uh, if, if the hospitals are working, education is working, etc. And even if it's uh, some NGO that's providing it, the state can't be that bad, you know. So, so there's a win-win situation. What I'm saying is there's a win-win situation here, uh, as, ultimately. As long as, as long as regulation is there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And may I use the opportunity because I think it's important to uh, you know to attribute the work uh, to the people who did it. Uh, so the two books I was I've been referring to is the one is by Melanie Kamet, uh, who has done a fantastic book on Hezbollah in Lebanon with Cornell University Press, and the other one is Sarah Roy, who's done a book with Princeton University Press on Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Both highly recommended because they try to come up with a more nuanced a picture of the role of these uh, Islamist militants, uh, uh, militant groups in these two areas as governance providers. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, um, and um, Trout Meyer, uh, please go on. And I'd like to say that I didn't know uh, Trout Meyer before. Uh -huh. And I was looking uh, while uh, waiting to, to, I did Google and she's from social policy and she's from 
working on Europe, um, yeah, yeah. Germany. And so I think what does she do in, in effective governments in areas of limited uh, statehood? And it means, for me, it means that the paradigm, the concept is rel relative widely across the social sciences. So thank you, Trout, and, uh, mm -hmm. and please thank you. go on. Thank you very much. And in fact, I got my degree in politics from the pre-university, from the Aussie, some time ago, a long time ago. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm interested in this is, is that I'm looking at welfare state development. And I have recently done more work and teaching on global developments and uh, looked at the um, emerging, emerging social security systems in in the global south and in that regard um, uh, is my, I'm, I'm asking this question which is um, the uh, you said that uh, I think limited statehood under limited statehood governance works in the if there is absence of violence or if violence is reduced um, and my question is um, is there not a correlation between limited statehood and rising levels of violence? And uh, so would that not mean that in the absence of limited, if you have limited statehood, autom automatically you would have more violence and therefore there is a less of a chance that governance would work? Uh, uh, linked to this is the question, I mean, you talked about women there and uh, violence against women in failed states. And how visible does it have to be? So how do you really uh, measure these things when it's very hard to see what the degree of violence is? Thank you. Um, uh, you are right. It's uh, one measurement of limited statehood is indeed the presence or absence of the, uh, of the monopoly over the means of violence. Um, long uh, long story in that sense it is related to security the, but the second measurement is actually about administrative capacity and even if a state is actually able to provide some sort of public security it doesn't mean that it has to it has the administrative capacity to uh, enforce rules the law uh, etc so other, otherwise the whole thing would be a complete tautology um, um, uh, of course. And to you, Tanya. And just to emphasize, statehood is a property that can also be acquired by non-state actors. Coming back to uh, Hamas in Gaza, right? G Hamas has statehood. It claims the monopoly over the use of violence, right? I'm not sure to what extent. It, there is variation. Oops, Thomas, you have to stay still. If I move, you have to have to be stationary because otherwise the camera is overwhelmed. So, um, so in a way, you know, also companies in some areas have acquired the monopoly over the use of violence, right? So we de we decouple statehood as a quality from the state as an actor and as a rule structure, right? For the state, it's constitutive to have statehood, but that doesn't mean that other actors cannot acquire acquire statehood and they often do uh, without becoming state actors and that is of course that the question is what is a state and what does it take to be a state coming back to the Somaliland it looks like a state it walks like a state and the only thing that uh, prevents it from being a state is the lack of international recognition right so um I just want to wanted to flag that and finally statehood per se again is may be part of the solution, but very often it is part of the problem, right? And thirdly, the use, the, the basic, the absence of violence, very often that comes back to a point Tolga made about policy variation. This is what, what Thomas mentioned about the role, what's left for the state. Very often uh, non-state actors, or many non-state actors, NGOs, companies are shy away from providing security functions, unless they're paid for. I'm not talking about private security companies here, right? But, um, and also the acceptance on part of the population, security be provided by non-state actors is a huge issue. And thirdly, 
many non-state actors expect a certain level of basic security to go in and provide governance provisions. If, and this is also the, the same is true for basic infrastructure. If there are no roads, right, that NGOs can use to get to these remote areas in order to vaccinate children, for instance, they're not going to build them, right? And they're not going to ask the Chinese to do that for that matter. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Tanya, we are uh, beyond the, the one hour limit, uh, but I, I still want to, to ask Eva, to let Eva the opportunity to comment and for you to, to answer shortly. If there will be a time, I will uh, ask you one more question. Uh, Eva, please. Okay, I should be short. It's, um, it's, a, it's a rather a general question about what is the lesson for the modern state now, because I've uh, lately been involved in, in critical feminist theory and uh, and uh, EU governance, multi-level governance. And what shows there very clearly is um, that, of course, our understanding of the modern state, hierarchy, blah, 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 all the virtues it has is, of course, historically socially grown. And now my, my question really looking at, I mean, I think conceptually you have certain categorical shifts, like if there's no peace, categorically, there's a problem for governance, if I understand correctly. So this is the conceptual question. Where are the categorical red lines? And linked to that, trust and in institutions, does trust replace institutions also? Or are institutions necessary to build trust if it's, if it's not the state? And really my, my key question is, when it's about delivering what your normative goals, like Denmark and social policy and all, all, all the limitations modern states have, not so much, say, the early modern state that ensured at first of all, peace, peace and not social welfare or whatever. Is that a categorical point that, you know, establishing peace and then then the other things follow from that? And does your research have lessons for corrections maybe of the modern state where actually our understanding of the modern state has certain deficiencies because the underlying concept of tr building trust and uh, whatever order on a smaller scale by the functionalities that we assume a modern state now has to have and try to export to the whole world and blah, 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 have certain deficiencies that you see in your research. So that's my core question. Thank you. This is a very good question. You remember the uh, the collaborative research center, the SFB uh, uh, transformation of state. They have this, um, these in Bremen, in Bremen, in Bremen, they works. have this evolution of the modern state, right, where it's, it becomes layered. So it starts with security and then you add a second layer and a third layer and a fourth layer. Um, and you would essentially argue what at the core, the minimum, what the state, normatively speaking, that's a normative point or two, right, is, is security. And for us, we are not normative, we are empirical. And what we can say though, and this is what Thomas already mentioned, in principle, people, even if they have had no positive experience with the state, prefer the state to provide governance over other actors. I'm very sorry. And this is so this is a global finding. And this is not, I mean, you can argue structural power, you know. I mean, the West has been extremely successful in, in exporting, projecting its model of the modern state to other areas. But we have to accept the fact that people don't want companies and not even NGOs in the long run to provide governance, particular not security, right? And so I think there is a lot to be said coming back to Tolga's point about policy variation. But for us, it would be an empirical question, right? Which governance services the people want to be have provided by what actors, right? And they rather have the companies pay into a fund to their very corrupt government in order to pay for roads they're never going to get because of the rent-seeking elites uh, they have elected, right? And still, they don't want the companies to build the roads, right, to run the schools. There is a lack of trust. And it is an empirical finding, which sometimes I find hard to understand why people put greater trust in state institutions, no matter how corrupt they are and how dysfunctional they are. But this is, there is a, a normative a Fluchtpunkt, right? Sort of a horizon of legitimacy that puts the state in the middle. And uh, always saying 
normative or not, in many areas, this is not an option. And to just reiterate Thomas's point, by trying to build a state, very often you get the opposite, right? Things become worse because if it's not a liberal and democratic state that embeds, right, the monopoly of the use of force at the same time, what you more often than not get is you strengthen re repressive, corrupt regimes and that make things worse rather than better. And that is, I think, the point we want to carry home. Thomas? Yeah, yeah, look at Belarus. Uh, Belarus has the I mean, uh, has the monopoly uh, the, over the use of violence, as we can see. And what does it use it for? Uh, for repression. You know, even against aircraft, uh, civilian aircraft now uh, uh, that are in the airspace. Okay. Yeah. Um, last. Uh, question before uh, I let you go, I know that we are over time, is uh, on the kind of the use of mode of govern governance. I know that you refer to, to those issues uh, within, uh, within the books, um, but can, can you elaborate on the way you, you think about modes of go governance? Do you distinguish between hierarchical to non-hierarchical, state and non-state, uh, market, networks, hierarchies? Wh which way you goes in this direction? Is it a promising way to think about governance uh, for the future? Well, I know this is, is not new, but still. That's an excellent question, David. How much, how much time do we have? I mean, we could probably <laughs> discuss this for another hour. Um, but very briefly, um, it is very hard to reduce the provision of governance to one particular mode. I think the key lesson we've learned is that, the, you know, we've always said that the, the modern state doesn't only govern hierarchically, right? In fact, what, what characterizes the modern state and Renate Mainz and in her institute, they have not only conceptualized and theorized, but also empirically shown it time and again, that the modern state governs with rather than monopolizes the provision of governance, right? But what the modern state can always do because it has consolidated statehood, uh, more often than not, is, you know, there's the shadow of hierarchy and the shadow of hierarchy is a powerful incentive for, for non-state actors to engage in governance and it's also an important factor to guarantee a certain effectiveness of their governance contribution. And that, this, 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 so, and the second point is then, then we thought this, this, the shadow of hierarchy is absent in areas of limited state by, by definition, but no, first you can produce this external, you can produce an external shadow. And secondly, even non-state actors have the possibility to govern hierarchically, coming back to the point that statehood is a quality or a property that non-state actors can acquire. So the equation of hierarchical coordination with the state who has the full variety of modes at its disposal, whereas non-state actors can only govern non-hierarchical empirically this, I mean, even theoretically, it doesn't really make sense because hierarchy does not only rely on the monopoly over the use of force, right? And plus non-state actors can acquire the monopoly of the use of force in the territory they control, right? Uh, so you have warlords, you have, uh, you have organized crime, the mafia. So in, in that regard, I think this is the most important insight we've Gain from uh, our, uh, we have a whole chapter in the book on, uh, on modes of governance, and it's all I mean, the modes all are over, all over, over the place. place. <laughs> yeah. I mentioned in the presentation the so called traditional authorities, uh, they don't have a mon not at least not a traditional monopoly uh, over the use of violence in most cases. Nevertheless, do they govern hierarchically? You bet, yeah and very hierarchically sometimes, command and control uh, over the tribe, etc. Why can they do this? Because they enjoy the legitimacy, yeah? A voluntary compliance with costly rules, yeah? So, uh, so the, the equation hierarchy is the state, non-hierarchy is non-state actors doesn't work. Uh, another, by the way, this is just, uh, just on the side, another equation, State actor 
equals public actor, non-state actor equals private actor, doesn't work. Uh, that's Eurocentric history, that kind of stuff. But we have many states where the state actors behave like private actors and some non-state actors behave like public actors, i.e. providing some common good. So a lot of these equations that we sort of grew up with, with our European or Western centric experiences uh, go uh, down the toilet. Uh, sorry. Um, well, I mean, expression. <laughs> this, this is something where we fundamentally disagree. I think public no. actors is not the, the, the question how they behave, but the commitment or the, 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 the standards against which they can be held responsible or accountable. And these accountability mechanisms are often not there or not effective in areas of limited statehood. That brings us back that it's not modern statehood. It's it, it, statehood constrained by the rule of law and by some participatory mechanism. It doesn't have to be liberal democracy, but it, there needs to be some participation here. And David, since we're running out of time, I just wanna say how great it is to see so many known faces. And next to Renate Mainz, who's been with this project from the very beginning, we are deeply touched that Lutz Leisering is here because you were, I think, the you were part of our ev first evaluation. Uh, you were one of the evaluators. So, so I, without Lutz, this whole research exactly so uh, would not have yeah. come about. And without Renate, same thing. And also, right? David, uh, again, regulation and governance. The Absolutely. two articles we were able to publish uh, there has helped us tremendously to develop our arguments. So, thank you so much. This is a fantastic opportunity to engage with you again and to show what we've managed to come up with uh, with all the fantastic input we got from you during the years it's been 15 years or something thomas yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you very you much uh, all of you. Um, it's a pleasure to have you and to see all those uh, great uh, uh, heroes uh, from from the past from you know my the very beginning of my development as political scientist uh, thank you, Lutz. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, uh, uh, Tanya. And uh, this video will be available on our channel. And so will be uh, many others in the future. And there is uh, quite many already on our channel. See you all uh, soon. And thank you very much. Thank you all, Eva. It was great to see you, Tolga. And again, take care. Okay, and see you soon. Bye.